Now, as you know, for the past 11 days, Japan has been reeling from an unprecedented human disaster of really epic proportions. First, a record-breaking earthquake, 8.9 on the Richter scale, off the northeastern coast of Japan. Then a towering 10-meter tsunami, which killed tens of thousands of Japanese people and destroyed everything in its path. But that was just two disasters. Soon after, the earthquake automatically shut down six nuclear reactors of the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear power plant. But in doing so, it also knocked out the power grid. And this forced operators to use backup generators to keep the coolant flowing into hot reactor cores. And then, the tsunami swept in and knocked out the generators. And this disruption in electricity finally knocked out the cooling systems of the nuclear power plant. So all at once, four out of six nuclear reactors were in dire trouble from overheating. Three reactors threatening meltdown and a fourth reactor on fire in its spent fuel storage pool. A devastating triple whammy, you might say. Now, there are few environmental dangers more lasting or more fearsome than radiation from a nuclear reactor after an accident. We saw this in 1986 in Chernobyl and now in Fukushima. And both these accidents demonstrate the undeniable truth of Murphy's Law. If something can go wrong, in time it will go wrong. Now the chances of a catastrophic earthquake and a biblical tsunami occurring together in an area with nuclear reactors are extremely low. But after Fukushima, the intrinsic dangers of nuclear power plants can no longer be dismissed lightly. So what about nuclear energy? It all goes back to the Second World War, when the twin terrors of nuclear energy and nuclear weapons were spawned by scientists working secretly on a military project. The Manhattan Project succeeded in spitting the nucleus of the uranium atom, unlocking the secret of nuclear physics, and releasing the unseen, unimaginable energy lurking within. And this nuclear energy was then used to prime two, at two atomic bombs, which were dropped, as you know, on Hiroshima and Nagasaki in 1945 instantly obliterating the two cities. And that was a war crime that went unpunished. Now Japan, the only country to have experienced nuclear warfare, now faces another nuclear nightmare. Months may pass before we can fully understand and learn from the Fukushima nuclear accident. It has rekindled fading memories of Chernobyl and shifted the balance in the debate on climate change and the risks and benefits of nuclear energy. It is forcing many countries 
to review the safety of their nuclear facilities and their energy policies, except in Malaysia, obviously. Germany has responded to strong political, to strong public anti-nuclear sentiment by reinstating and accelerating its nuclear phase-out policy and by <coughs> temporarily sh shutting down the oldest seven of its 17 nuclear reactors. Both India and China, with their expanding economies and energy needs, are reviewing their nuclear safety measures, but have not shelved plans to build more reactors in the next 10 years. But there is a growing conviction worldwide that nuclear power should be phased out, and a serious commitment made to invest in renewable energy, energy efficiency, and energy conservation. So what about Malaysia and what's happening here? In Malaysia, the Minister of Energy, Green Technology and Water responded to Fukushima by covering his political back and saying that the decision to build two nuclear reactors in Malaysia would only be made after his colleagues in cabinet had evaluated a paper to be submitted by the new Malaysian Nuclear Power Corporation, a creature of the Economic Transformational Program. Now questions need to be asked. Is it possible that the Green Minister believes that nuclear energy is green? Does the government not think that such a crucial issue as nuclear energy deserves a national debate. Does it think that it can make a responsible unilateral decision and then justify it by claiming that it has studied and accepted a report from the very company that would benefit from Malaysia's foray into nuclear energy? That's how the government works, the federal government, not the state government. Now all this in spite of the fact that Malaysia has a surplus energy supply and does not need nuclear power. Perhaps the government is unaware of this, or perhaps it's beginning to believe its own propaganda and misinformation. Now the nuclear industry has carried the stamp of secrecy like a birthmark. From its very beginning, the nuclear industry has had a long history of cover-ups and downright deception, with the occasional lapse into silence, the silence of guilt. Public trust in the promoters of nuclear power is almost non-existent. In Britain, America, Germany, Russia, Japan, and many other countries, people have not been told the truth about nuclear mishaps and near misses. The stricken Japanese population is well aware of the culture of nuclear cover-ups. The Tokyo Electric Power Company, or TEPCO, Asia's biggest utility company, owns and operates the Fukushima nuclear power plant. In 2002, TEPCO's chairman and senior executives had to resign when the Japanese government discovered that they had covered up several cracks and other structural damage to reactors. In 2006, TEPCO admitted it had been falsifying data about coolant materials in its reactors over a long period. And so we should be asking questions again. In a nuclear crisis, there are many questions, and it is a nightmare trying to make sense of the uncertainties as the Japanese people 
are now discovering after Fukushima. Now radiation is invisible. So how do you know when you are in danger? How long will this danger persist? How can you reduce the danger to yourself and your family? What level of exposure is safe? How do you get access to vital information in time to prevent or minimize exposure? What are the potential health risks and consequences of exposure? Whose information can you rely on or trust? How do you rebuild a healthy way of life in the aftermath of a nuclear disaster? These questions are difficult to answer and they become even more complicated when governments and the nuclear industry maintain tight control of information technological operations, scientific research, and the biomedical lessons that shape public health response. This regulation of the nuclear industry, or in effect, the censoring of information, has been present since the nuclear age began. It explains why there is no clear consensus on what Fukushima means in terms of local and global health. It's all very fuzzy in Fukushima and in Japan. Immediately after the earthquake and tsunami, the Japanese government and TEPCO issued statements reporting minor damage at the nuclear power plant. Later, government and industry officials reported, and I quote, venting of hydrogen gas and that there was no threat to health. And when hydrogen gas explosions took place, there were reassurances of health safety. In fact, the hydrogen released is actually tritium water vapor, which is a low emitter of radiation which can be absorbed into the body through breathing or by drinking contaminated water. Tritium decays by beta emission and has a radioactive half-life of about 13 years. And once tritium enters the body, it is uniformly disseminated and is excreted through urine within a month after in ingestion. It produces a low level radiation and may cause toxic effects that damage the kidney. As with all ionizing radiation, exposure to tritium increases the risk of cancer. <coughs> 